Hey, this is gonna be a great opportunity for us to bring our friends, to bring our neighbors, to bring our people into this place and to come and welcome them. Easter's so awesome, we can't just do it one morning, right? Like it's not just Sunday morning. And so I hope you know we have, it's so awesome. We have a Good Friday service that'll be happening on Friday. We have our egg extravaganza happening on Saturday. Um, it's an Easter egg hunt. And uh, just in this week, we have a, a uh, what do you call it? A little petting zoo kind of thing coming. So we have some animals that are gonna be up in here. Cherie just did it. Cherie just booked it. She's like, hey, I got them coming. So yeah, you can thank Cherie for all the awesome stuff that's going to be happening for sure. Hey, uh, my name is Austin and I am the next gen pastor here. And so all in Sunday, I always kind of want to do something at the get go. Okay. And so first thing is that parents, I just want to talk to you for a sec. Okay. Um, I have three little kids at home. Okay. And so if I couldn't communicate like seriously, um, with a little background noise or if a little movement going on, then my wife and I wouldn't have had a serious conversation in the last seven years, okay? Uh, so there's gonna be some movement, there's gonna be some chatter, I know it, and it's cool. We're cool, all right, parents? It's all good. And neighbors of parents said, okay, cool, yes, good. Uh, also, but, and this is maybe even more important, kids, would you just kind of look at me real quick? Kids, if you're in the room, if you need to get to a spot where you can see me like standing on a chair or something, go ahead and do it. If your parents are cool, do it so you can look right at me, yeah. Listen, I love that you kids are in here. I am the next generation pastor here, and so I am your pastor, and I just want you to know, it is our highest hope that you would know and love Jesus, for sure. That is our highest hope. But it's a really close second that I hope you would love his church. I hope that you kids would love being here. And so I know that it's gonna be tough to listen to a grown-up talk for basically forever this morning, okay? But if you can stick with me, if you can hang with me, I really think the message that God is gonna teach us this morning has the potential to change our lives forever, okay? And so let's listen and let's have some fun this morning. Can we do that? Can we do that all together, church family, yeah? Okay. So... Listen, it's just, it's fun. I gotta just admit, it's, we're in a sweet season here as, this, as the church. We, we've grown over the last year and we're in this spot where we've, we're now seeing like people, this church has been around for 40 years. Like not every church can say that. And so we have families who have grown up and who have had kids and now those kids are growing up and having kids, right? And, and we have new people calling this place home. We have people making decisions for Jesus. We have all sorts of just great growth happening. And I just wanna say, like as one of your pastors, it's an encouraging season to be a part of this family. And I love All In Sunday because now what we get to do is we get to all get together in one room and we all get to celebrate some awesome things that are going on in this church, but then we also get to gather all together. We don't split up in a couple services, but we every now and then get together and gather in one room and teach and listen and learn what God is doing in us and through us, amen? And it's such a fun thing to be a part of and this series that we've been in, and so kids, you gotta know the adults have been in this room in a series on worship. We've been talking about worship for the past few weeks, and it's been so good. Pastor Ken has been pulling us back on our perspective of worship, showing us that it's not just singing, it's not just songs that we do on Sunday morning, but it's a way of life, right? Like it's what we do, it's what we were made for. He, he taught us the chief end of man last week is to what? to glorify God and enjoy him for forever. Exactly, just like you just said it. I heard everyone say it in unison, right? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's not just some catchy slogan, it's what we were made to do. It's our most high calling. It's the most fulfilling thing we could ever find on this earth, is to be glorifying God and to be enjoying him for forever. And so I get to actually kind of dive in on one point today because Kent has taken us through this broad look of worship, but today I get to drill in on praise, on singing, on what worship is. And today we're gonna to talk about how worship is a weapon. It's a weapon that we get to use. It's a weapon that God's equipped us with. And it's gonna, I'm gonna take us through a, three, a few things, three things. And so kids, hopefully you got like your little note sheet and you can maybe take some notes. But if you're taking notes today, I'm gonna walk us through how um, songs, songs get stuck in us. Songs get stuck in us. They, they get into us. It's not just something we do out, but it's something that actually comes in. And then I'm also gonna talk about how, man, it does more than we think it does. 
Music is not just something that we sing in the car or at a concert or in the shower. Like, it's actually doing something inside of us. It's deeper than we think it is. And then I'm going to show us that, in fact, worship is a weapon, and that works in a few different ways. So are we ready to go? Should we jump right in this message? Okay, so if you're ready, turn to your neighbor, say, I'm ready. And now ask your other neighbor, say, other neighbor, are you ready? All right, here we go. So listen, the first thing that we're going to talk about with music today is that songs are sticky. Songs are sticky. Kids, so if you want to write that down on your little sheet today, you got a special sheet. You can write just that. That's my first point today. Songs are sticky. And so let me just be honest with you, okay? This is a very simple point. This is something that we all actually understand very well, but I don't want us to blow right past it because I think even though the truth is simple, the application is profound, okay? And so... I I thought I'd do this this morning. I think there's a lot of songs that we could go back and if I sang just one line from them, you could snap right to it and you could probably finish the rest of the song. And so rather than me sing, we actually pulled clips of it and everybody said, amen. Amen. Okay, good. So um, we got a lot of generations in the room. All right, yeah, we got a lot of different people here, a lot of different ages. So I tried to pull from a lot of different areas. So let's just kind of jump right in. If you know it and you want to sing it, go for it. But more important than that, I want you to know that, like, yeah, I actually know all the lyrics to this song, and there's probably one of them that you do. So let's go ahead, Don. Walking through a party in the county jail, the prison band was there, they began to wail. The band was jumping and the joint began to swing. You should have heard this knocked out jailbird sing. Yeah, come on, there you go. We could do this one all day, couldn't we? Okay, hey, before we play the last one, Don, kids, kids, listen to me. This is your moment. If you know this one, sing it out loud, okay? Let's put it on. Yeah, come on. Parents, that's going to be in your head the rest of the day, and I'm not even sorry about it. It's just, it's something in me, it's in my heart, I'm working on it, okay, but I'm just not even sorry about that. So, songs are sticky, they get stuck in our heads, right, and there's songs like that, there's so many other songs that you know that get stuck into you. And it's so easy, like, here's the thing, you're not going to go home today, you're not going to get in your car, and you're not going to, if you start singing a song in your car, it's not going to be my sermon that you're going to be singing, right? It's going to be one of the songs we sang this morning, or it's going to be Baby Shark, because now it's stuck in there for the rest of the day. Imagine, I've been preparing this all week. I've been thinking about Baby Shark all week. And so, but songs get in us, and, and with this, we can't miss the truth that comes out of this, okay? And so, yes, songs are sticky. They get stuck in our head, and that can be irritating, but it can also be powerful, A few weeks ago, Pastor Kent used this verse, Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Like, remember, he used that tea, that picture of tea, and said if you just dip that tea in and take it right out, that's that's not as good as it could be, right? If you want to drink tea, you put the tea bag in there and you let it soak. You You let it sit there for a while. And so you want that with the word of Christ. You want it to dwell in you richly. You want it to get in you. You want it to be stuck in there. And look at what the rest of the verse says teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And so what this is so cool because what happens with singing, when we sing good, gospel-rich, biblically-based songs, that truth gets in us. It dwells in us richly, right? And so You can get irritated by the fact that songs get stuck in your head, or you can acknowledge the fact that, man, I have an opportunity to hear to get some great stuff stuck in me. And man, if you think of all the hymns, all the, we had a group of older people who came in and sang, some of the empty nesters came in, you guys just sang hymns this week. It was awesome. I walked in, I was just like, man, I don't think I'm on the right demographic to jump in there, but I want to, you know? Like you guys know those songs and they're stuck in you and there's such rich truth in there that is now woven into part of you. It's woven into your soul. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I just don't think we can skip over this truth. It's why I had um, Garrick and the team put in Just Give Me Jesus a month ago into the elementary um, room 
Because I said, man, just give me Jesus. That is the kind of truth that I want woven into my kid's heart, right? In Psalm 119, it talks about hiding the word of God in your heart. And like, that's the kind of truth I want them to know. The man of like, if you take away everything else, just give me Jesus and I'll be all right. And when I take my eyes off him, that's when confusion starts to win. Like, don't let me get caught up in the cares and worries of this world. Like, just give me Jesus and I know that I can make it. I know that my tomorrow is safe with him. Like, church, isn't that the kind of stuff that we want the next generation knowing? We want them not to just think that. We want them to know it down in their soul. And songs are sticky. Songs get stuck in us. I can remember a states song from the fourth grade. I know all the states in alphabetical order because of a song I learned in the fourth grade. That's the same opportunity. Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California. I just heard somebody yell, prove it. So I was like, okay, I could keep going if you want, but I'm not going to. So it's this opportunity that each of us have with all of our kids. Choose the stuff that we're listening to wisely. So let's keep moving because songs aren't just sticky, but music is deep. Music is deep. It does more than what we think it does. And so this is, again, this is something intuitively you already know because the songs that you put when you have company over for dinner that you play lightly in the background probably doesn't match the songs that you put in your ears when you're exercising. And that's probably not the same music that you use to study with because music and science, it all, it's, it all, they all agree and it lines up really well. That's like music is doing more inside of us than just getting into our ears. It helps us with things like study. It helps our ability to recall information. It, it's even been proven that the type of music you have on in the background will affect like fetal development for moms who are pregnant, right? And so you will put on different music for different situations that doesn't always match. And so you already intuitively know this. You don't need me to prove it with some sort of scientific study that music is deep. It does things. In fact, um, probably one of the more interesting things that I, when I was researching this this week was um, people who are struggling and are in the throes of Alzheimer's or dementia. It's not uncommon for if you were to put on a song or a hymn from, from far back, from a former time, right, that that person who is now a shadow of themselves, who can't maybe even remember their own kids' names, right, they'll hear that song from yesteryear and they'll snap back for just a moment and they'll know, that they'll come back for a moment. And it's this fascinating thing that we can see that music is deep. It does something in us. And so a couple years back when we had our foster boys, we fostered three young boys. And the oldest one, who was about five years old, uh, struggled. He was tormented with night terrors. Just consistently, he would wake up in the middle of the night. And it wasn't just like a, hey, bud, like, wake up, wake up, snap out of it. It would take, it would take time. Like, it would take 10 minutes, 20 minutes just to get him to realize that he was safe. Like, it was terrible. And he was tormented. And and we tried different things and he started getting going in counseling and that was helping a little bit. And we put a nightlight in his room so that he knew he was safe, so that when he woke up, when his eyes were open, he could see that it was safe, right? And we tried to just let time heal that wound that was in him. And none of, the th those, none of those things helped as much as music did. And so what Katie and I did is we just, we got an iPad and we just had it on a Spotify like worship playlist and it just played in their room 24 seven. Like it just, not, it didn't go off all day, every day. And I'm not saying that his night terrors went away completely, but they helped, it was helped immensely. And so check it out, like music is deep. You already intuitively know this. You don't need me to prove it to you. You practice it in the way you do things. But don't just take an anecdote of mine. Like let's also look at what the Bible has to say. And so let's, let's flip over to 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. So if you have your Bible and you wanna open it up, go ahead. 1 Samuel chapter 16, we're going to start in verse 14. It's going to be on the screens as well. Um, elementary students, this is actually, we're going to pick it up kind of where you guys were last week. We're talking about King Saul today, okay? So you guys have been learning about King Saul. We're going to pick it up in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Some of Saul's servants said to him, A tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever your tormenting spirit troubles you. He will play soothing music and you will soon be well again. All right, Saul said, find me someone who plays well. 
and bring him here. Let's keep going. Next slide. So David went to Saul. So they end up finding David. They bring David in. They say, he can play the harp. Let's get him in here. And David went to Saul and began serving him. Saul loved David very much, and David became his armor bearer. And then Saul sent word to Jesse, asking, Please let David remain in my service, for I am very pleased with him. And whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp. And then Saul would feel better, and the tormenting spirit would go away. And so music is doing something. Music is, it's not just surface level something that's going into our ears. There's a physiological response that's happening. There's even something spiritual that's going on when we're listening to music. It's getting inside of us. It's doing something to us. And um, listen, I want to do something real quick. There, there are times that I really can't put my finger on it, but there are times when I've been in a worship set, been listening to worship music, gathering with other people, singing songs to God, and there's been something in me that is broke, and something happens, right? Like, and I think we can all relate to this, but there's been times when an immense joy has fell upon me. There's been times when my faith feels like it's waning, and I'm not as strong in believing as I once was, but I go into a worship set, and then something happens, something clicks, something breaks, and my faith is just fanned into a flame, right? And so rather than just me, let's do this, let's raise our hand. And so I'm not just asking if one time in a worship set you got the goosebumps because everything just kind of lined up right, okay? But what I'm asking is, is anybody else in the room, have you experienced personally a time when you were in worship, you were singing to God and something changed, something was different, anxiety was broke, there was a hope that was restored. Can we just raise our hands if that's been you? Okay, so keep your hands up for a sec. Like, look around. Either we're all crazy or this is true, right? Like music is doing something. There's something happening, happening spiritually when we're worshiping the Lord, when we're listening to music, okay? And so before we get into my last point that worship is in fact a weapon, I just wanna, I wanna lay before you a question that I have. Um, what kind of music are you consistently listening to? Somebody in the room just thought, oh no, I have to stop listening to Taylor Swift now, okay. That's not exactly what I'm saying, but I am saying, what are you listening to? You have an opportunity to get songs stuck in you, and we all acknowledge that music is deep. It's doing something in us. And so what are you letting come into you? I think we have to be so careful and aware of this because every now and now then I'll find myself agitated or irritated. And the first thing I can usually do is ask myself, what am I listening to? Because sometimes the music I'm listening to is matching what's manifesting in me. Right? And so I'll go, man, why am I just so irritated right now? And it's because I've been listening to like this like dubstep music that I listen to at the gym when I'm trying to be like crazy, when I'm trying to be agitated so that I work out better. But if I listen to that too much, then it, it can spill over into arenas that I don't want it to. And so you have an opportunity with music. You can, do, you can get songs stuck in you for good. You can get God's truth stuck in you. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying that means you can never listen to secular music again, Okay. We can all acknowledge there's been a lot of good secular music that's been written, but don't dismiss the opportunity that we have to get good stuff into us, and let's not discredit the fact that music might be affecting our mood and our behavior more than we think it is, okay? Okay, and so let's jump into this last point. In fact, worship is a weapon. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, worship is a weapon. Worship is a weapon. It sounds crazy. It sounds crazy, like singing songs. How is that being effective? How is that doing something? But it's true. We see it in Scripture, and we see it in our own lives, that worship is, in fact, a weapon, and it works in a few different ways. So the first way that worship happens is it changes our perspective. It changes our perspective. So we're going to read a story in First Chronicles about King Jehoshaphat, but let me kind of just like set the stage for you for what's going on in this story. So King Jehoshaphat's the king of Judah, right? And he gets this messenger that comes to him, and his messenger's like, hey, boss, listen, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but there are three gigantic armies right outside, and they're coming in, and they're ready to steamroll us, right? Like, it's a huge problem, and Jehoshaphat's like, okay, well, we should pray, right? Like, any of our responses would be like, let's pray about this, let's sit on it for a sec. And uh, in fact, it says that the whole city, women and children, all come to that same spot. They're like, we're toast. We can see all those bad guys out there. We should pray too. And so they all pray. And then while they're praying, one of King Jehoshaphat's buddies is like, hey, 
I just got a word from the Lord. Like, how exciting is it when your buddy's like, hey, I think I got a word from the Lord. And you're like, well, please tell me. Like, we're in huge trouble right now. I could use a word from the Lord. And he says, well, you know, like, it's a word from the Lord. It's not even our, God, God just told me it's not even our battle to fight. Like, we're going to not even have to deal with this. Like, it's already over. Like, let's shut it down. It's done. It's finished. God's going to step in and do this. We don't have to. And so let's pick up the story there to see where it goes. Second Chronicles, chapter 20. Jehoshaphat, after consulting the people, the king appointed singers, what? To walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him. Okay, so pause for just a second. He puts the band on the front line. Like he says, okay, here, I got this great idea. Let's, like, let's just line up the choir to go out in front of us, right? And so what we have to acknowledge is that first things first is that the perspective was off. In the beginning, before they were praying, the enemy looked big. The enemy looked huge and God seemed small. Like, God, where, where are you at? What are you going to do? There's a huge problem out there. And I think you might not have three armies bearing down on your life, but you might have come to God before saying, hey, look, I have this huge problem. I got something I can't deal with. It's huge out there. And then you come to God and you say, hey, what can you do about it? And so the perspective at first is problem is big, God is small, and then he comes and he puts the singers on the front line? Like that's his response. It's like, hey, so I got a great idea. We're just going to put these guys and they're going to sing at this army. That's what we'll do. So, okay. You're just going to go out there, guys, and this is what you're going to sing. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. At the very moment they began to sing. The very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. Okay. So now the perspective's starting to shift. All of a sudden, my enemy doesn't seem so intimidating because they're starting to fight each other. Seems like they forgot who they're fighting against. They're just starting to fight each other. And now all of a sudden, God seems big because I didn't have to pick up a weapon. He used his own. He, he did it. He stepped in. He started fighting on my behalf. Let's see how, let's keep going. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived, so finally they're like, okay, I guess we should all go out there. The band's done their thing. Let's just send the army out to maybe clean some stuff up. But then the army gets there. Army of Judah arrives at the lookout point in the wilderness and all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemies had escaped. And so the first way we use worship as a weapon is not to actually fight an enemy, it's to fight our own bad perspective. And so when we sing God's truth, when we declare what God has done, it doesn't at first go out and attack enemies, it first attacks our heart that is maligned, it has a bad perspective. And it reminds us of who God is, just how big he is, just how much he can do, right? So you read a story like this, and man, people say the Bible's boring. I say to high schoolers all the time, Bible's not boring, you're boring. The Bible's awesome. The Bible's filled with good stuff. It's not boring at all. So the first way that worship is a weapon is it fights our bad perspective. The second way, though, is that worship is absolutely a weapon that we use, and it fights for us. Worship, worship is absolutely a weapon that we can pick up, and it fights for us. We're not going to read the story, but think about the story of Jericho. Think about how much sense that story makes. Hey, there's a huge fortified city in our way. We need to take it. The army of Israel needs to take over this huge, walled, fortified city. And what's the solution? To walk around it a few times and then to yell at it, to sing at it, have the priests blow their trumpets at it. And then you have stories like Paul and Silas who get thrown in jail. They're thrown in jail for doing nothing wrong, by the way. They had just healed a girl. And then they, people get mad at him, the Roman officials get mad at him, and they throw them in jail. They have them all prison. They're shackled up. They're in chains. And what's their response? They sing. They sing so loud that the whole jail can hear them. And what happens to the jail? It comes crumbling down. What happens to the walls of Jericho? They're raised to the ground. And so, Austin, what are you saying? If I start singing like the city of Loveland might get blown into a pile of rubble, What I'm saying is that when you worship, walls that you've built up in your heart, 
strongholds that have you in chains will come to the ground. They can break, they can loosen. Something can happen when you worship that the Spirit of God moves in a certain way when we worship that it, it does something, it loosens something. You find freedom when you worship the Lord. There's strongholds in your life. There's things that you don't know how to get out of your way that when you sing at them, they come down. And so when we worship, when we sing, we're using a weapon that the Lord has given us. I love that the walls of Jericho did not come down by human-made weapons. God brought them down through the weapon of worship. They trusted him to do something insane. They trusted him to step out and do something crazy, and he delivered them. And so I I wonder how many of us, we need our perspective to shift. Maybe we need to not complain so much about the problems that we have in our life, but we need to actually sing to our problems, remind ourselves how big and how good our God is. And I wonder how many of us have given up fighting something that's in our lives and what you needed to do all along was just to sing to it. You needed to align yourself with what God says in, in his truth, in song, and what maybe that would do something to your problem. But it, worship is not just a weapon. It's not just a weapon that we use, we wield alone. Worship is a weapon we use together. Worship is a weapon we use together. I'm in this habit over the past couple of years Almost at every spot in the worship service, uh, I stop singing for just a moment just to hear everybody else sing, right? Because worship, worshiping together reminds us that we're not in this fight alone. And so here's the thing. When I first started coming to church, worship was for sure my least favorite part, right? It was the most uncomfortable time, all these people singing. And, and I, I, I always thought the people singing were better than me. Not vocally, like, because that's still true, right? Like, the, most people are better singers than me, and I'm okay with that. But I, I always thought the people were, like, better than me because they knew all the lyrics to the songs. Like, they didn't have to look, they didn't have to look at the slideshow to, like, know what, was, what songs to sing next. You know what I mean? They just knew all the lyrics. And so I always thought they were just better than me. They probably behaved better than me. They acted different than me. But now what I know is that people don't worship. People don't sing in church because they're better than me. They worship because they're exactly like me, Right? Like we're all here singing to the same God for the same reasons because we're all broken, we're all desperate, we're all in need of him to save us and that's why we sing. And when we worship together, our worship is a weapon that we don't use by ourselves. It's powerful by itself. You can use it by yourself. You can use it in your car, singing by yourself. You can use it in your quiet space, in your alone time. You can use worship alone, but I'm also just here to tell us that we can use worship together. We can fight together. Because when we worship, when you sing with your church, when you sing with your family, you're reminded that you're not in this fight alone, you're in it with your people. You're fighting with your family. You're in this together. You have your place here. And that's what this is about. In this room, all in Sunday, all of us worshiping together. The kids, the grandmas, the grandpas, all of us spanning, worshiping together, and we're reminding ourselves when we sing that nobody is in this fight by themselves. Nobody should be in this fight alone. We're in it together, amen? Amen. And so, here's the thing. Worship is sticky. Music is deep. Songs are sticky. Music is deep. And worship is a weapon. My guess is that if you've been around church for a minute, none of this really is new to you. It's not, I don't think it's really catching many people off guard this morning. Maybe you learned something this morning, but maybe you didn't. Maybe you've heard a message just like this this before. And so the question that I kept asking myself and asking the Lord is like, God, I've, I've heard this message taught before. So what, what do you want to say this morning? Because I think we've heard this message before. And if I could sit down with every single one of you individually and ask, okay, worship is a weapon. Worship is a weapon. Who are you fighting? There'd be a handful of you that would be able to give me very real answers. You'd be fighting very big things. And you know exactly what it is right now, even as I'm saying it. Man, I'm I'm in opposition with this thing that I don't know how I'm going to win. And my encouragement to you is keep singing. Because songs get stuck. And as you sing at that problem, as you sing at that circumstance, you're going to remind yourself of who God is and what he's done. You're going to be reminded that God can show up and do things in profound ways. When we worship, we invite impossible outcomes into impossible situations. And then when you worship, when you're going to sing at your problem, you're going to be reminded that you're not in this fight alone. There are people all around you who are in this fight with you together. 
But my guess is that in a room like this in Loveland, Colorado, the biggest enemy that we're fighting is apathy. I think the biggest enemy that we're fighting in this town at this time in middle class, affluent Loveland, Colorado, is just not caring that much. Like, I say worship is a weapon, and you're like, yeah, but who am I fighting? What am I doing? And, and you're just, we, we can discredit the battle that's going on in our hearts that's drifting towards just not caring that much. And so I say, man, like, Jesus has saved you. And you go like, oh, yeah, I know. And I'm like, no, 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 like, you don't, like he has paid the price for your sins so that you don't have to. He died on the cross, defeated death, and rose on the third day so that you would never have to go through that, so that you could experience eternal life. You'd be like, oh my gosh, totally. <laughs> like, yes, I remember that. That's so good. Thank you for reminding me. Like, kids, here's what I'm talking about. I'm guessing that you asked for something this last Christmas, just a few months ago, right? Like, think about that thing that you put on the top of your list. Like, the best gift you could imagine. And then you got there. Perfect Sunday school answer from the front row here, by the way. But you put something on your Christmas list. It was a present. It was a thing. And you got it. You opened it. You ripped it open on Christmas morning, and it was awesome. And guess what? It was more than awesome. It was like better than you could have ever imagined that it was ever going to be. And you opened it up, and you played with it. Where is it today? Do you even know? Like, do we even know where that gift is at right now? When was the last time we played with it? Man, and that's just a few months ago. What about last Christmas? Like we are conditioned and programmed in our culture to always be asking for the next, always to be asking for the latest, the greatest, the newest, the best. And I just wonder if that attitude has crept its way into our church. And so we hear the gospel and we hear it presented plainly and we get bored with it. The church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation, they grew, they grew lukewarm. They were neither hot nor cold and that's why God spit them out of his mouth because they'd grown apathetic. They didn't care as much. And so worship is a weapon that we need in our lives today. We need to continue to sing. We need to continue to be reminded because here's what worship does. We stand right now in a place of already and not yet. Already and not yet. We live in this tension. And so already has God began to bring his kingdom to earth, but not yet has the world been perfectly redeemed right? Already has God um, come, but he's not yet returned. He has already saved me and changed me, and he's making me like him, but I'm not yet like him perfectly, right? I'm already beginning to understand all these awesome things about God, but I do not yet know him fully. Already has God began to bring heaven to earth, but it is not yet heaven on earth. Amen? I already have my ticket punched to go to heaven, but I am not there. I'm not yet in the spot where all sad things are untrue. I'm not yet in the spot where death and sickness are no more. I'm still here right now. And so what worship does is it speaks, it speaks to us in a way that meets us where we are already yet beckons us into the not yet. It aligns us to where we're going. It doesn't allow us to stay comfortable where we are. Like, praise the Lord, I'm not the person I used to be. But I'm not yet who I want to be. And so what worship does is it meets me in that moment and it pulls me to the next step. It pulls me along in my spiritual journey. It pulls me, it reminds me that, no, there's still work to be done here. There's still a kingdom to come. I still have things to do. I still have people in my life that don't know him. I still have students that I meet with regularly that are lost, that are broken, that are hurting. We're not yet there. We're not yet finished. It's already begun. God's already doing something great, but we're not yet finished. And worship stands in the place of already not yet. And so if your heart is prone to apathy, if our hearts, and we all are, it's the drift in every human heart, we can use worship as a weapon to sing in the already not yet. And so my prayer and my hope this morning is that, man, if you're up against a mountain, if you're fighting an enemy that looks 
like there's no way you could possibly overtake it. I pray that you would consider using worship as your weapon. For those of us who would maybe be willing enough to admit, man, I think my heart has drifted. I'm prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. If that's us this morning, would we be so bold and courageous to admit it and to let worship draw us out of that apathy, drop to blow on those teeny little embers of faith and blow them into fresh flame. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you are faithful in the middle. God, you're faithful to continue to give us your Holy Spirit in a time when we're maybe not even desperately searching for you. You meet us when we're desperately searching for you, but you also meet us when we're just casually getting by. And so God, this morning, I pray that you would meet every heart in this room exactly where it's at and that you would have worship be our remedy this morning. That you would have worship, singing songs to, to you, God, be the thing that draws us out, draws us up and into, aligns us with what you're doing, God. Would you let worship be the instrument that aligns us with what heaven is doing right now? God, we love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray.